Hey everyone, Jeffrey here. Uh, today I have Frederick. So Frederick joined the program uh, probably late, late 2020, 2020, I believe, right? And then, so I guess, tell the audience how things were like when you first started with me. Uh, what was your situation like at that point in time? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me on, uh, first of all. <laughs> uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think like back then, uh, that was like at the end of December, uh, me and my girlfriend, we were, uh, on a vacation in Spain, I think at the moment, um, which sounds pretty nice, but, uh, yeah, I think at that point, um, things were starting to uh, I was noticing some stuff with her going on with her. Um, and there was, yeah, a lot of like, there was like this distance between us uh, that I hadn't felt before up until then. It was almost like a, like a light switch that had just like turned off. Um, and how long you, were I, you guys together uh, at this point? Uh, at that point, we were together for three years. Yeah, Three years. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah. And, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't kind of figure out why. Um, but it was almost like, yeah, it's like a light switch went off and, um, yeah. Uh, I started to sort of panic as well in, in, in my head, uh, like what was going on, what is, what is happening here? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, which didn't make things better either. Yeah. So I think you were uh, telling me that at that point you went on a trip and then she felt like you felt like she wasn't, she didn't really want to be there anymore. Yeah, uh, exactly. And I think that coming from kind of the honeymoon period of the height of your relationship to where, how things are like now where it's so stale, it seems like where, yeah, you're not connecting anymore. Um, that that's the one you're saying that made you panic, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it kind of felt like it was something completely different, but like almost like in my mind, she had like changed. She was like a different person almost, you know? And then, <laughs> you know, so it really like uh, freaked me out. And then uh, of course that just made me go onto the spiral of, uh, you know, uh, we had like some fights and, uh, and things were not looking too good. Uh, and, you know, one thing led to another, um and we sort of yeah she sort of broke it off from there yeah so i think when you felt that distance coming along you mentioned to me too that you you felt panic you started to give a lot of ultimatums right what were those yeah. ultimatums you were giving like what was your mindset at that point in time what was your thinking yeah no that was that was completely uh like i think like i don't know if i even had a mindset back then it was just like <laughs> whatever uh i can i can throw throw at the wall so to say like uh, i need to do something and then whatever ideas popped up it could have been on instagram like you know uh all these weird advices you get from 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 places uh and then i just sort of went with that without even thinking about like what she was going through or you know what you know sort of things yeah. that i had done that could have led up to this um, what, what were the the alternatives you were giving if you don't mind me asking <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was sort of like yeah because we had a we have a long distance relationship so she, she lives in another city like in, in another country you know so um at that time it was like you know uh, you know, I don't think this is going to work out. You have to move to my place or, you know, it's going to be over, you know? Yeah. And that, that was sort of like the, the ultimatum that was being thrown. Yeah. I, I can probably see a bit of, um, unconditional love illusion or like soulmate delusion there where you feel like, yeah, you're my girlfriend now. So you should prioritize me. If you're not prioritizing me, then that's kind of your fault. That's kind of, you are the messed up one. Because I'm prioritizing you, but you didn't think for one second there, did I, was I the person that made it easy for her to prioritize me? Right. Yeah. Like, I think that wasn't going on in your thinking. So you exactly. played off all this, um, all this. Oh, by the way, too, are you guys still on distance right now? 
Uh, yeah, we're we're still long distance, yeah. but uh, you know we're we're like traveling to see each other a lot more. And I know and, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But I was gonna ask yeah, yeah. like later on in the future, because the reason why I think like your partner couldn't join this interview was because of that too. But next time, I want you and your partner together. <laughs> You're in the same okay, place. Yeah. that'd be super yeah. fun. But yeah, let's do it next time. But so you paid up all this like very needy things, and you do do the ultimatum. I think your hope at that point in time was for her to say, oh shit, you know what? You're, you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, Let me try harder. But what was her response instead? <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably that was going through my mind. Like, oh, I'm, I hope she will like realize, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, everything and, and, and this and that. And like, <laughs> you know, it's like sort of like crazy how like, and I didn't for one second, like think about like my own part of it, you know? And uh, yeah. So her response to that was, uh, you know, that was sort of like the last straw for her, I think, because I think that's even made her realize like how, how, um, like how blind I was to like the issues that we had in the relationship. Yeah. Uh, so I think that kind of, yeah, just, uh, yeah. Basically that's she said, good. okay, fine. I think we need to take a break. Right. I think we got to really got to take a break. And then that kind yeah. of threw you for a surprise because like you said, it, it tells her that, you know, like we're talking about this in a bit, there's so much baggage, there's so much pent up things that she cannot express because there's no safety. Mm. And instead of creating safety, you played the high value man card and you basically said like, well, I'm valuable. I'm flawless. So if you don't yeah. see the value in me, then something is wrong with you. But that's exactly why your partner never felt safe in the first place, because you thought you were so perfect anyway. Right. Yeah. We'll talk about yeah. that in a bit. Um, so that was December, 2021. Um, fast forward yourself to now. So for those of you who don't know Frederick, he's been vacationing for the last, I, I swear to you, you've been vacationing for the last four months, right? Like it's been a long, <laughs> how long have you been vacationing here? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been, yeah, that's, it's been a long, uh, yeah. A uh, couple of months. I just <laughs> just got back from uh, like a couple of weeks ago from, from uh, my girlfriend's place. And, uh, and before that, yeah uh to portugal uh budapest yeah a lot of places <laughs> <laughs> so how yeah. how did the vacations go so obviously uh, she was with you pretty much the whole time i'm guessing um tell, tell us how the relationship the dynamic the feeling has changed since last year to this year yeah wow uh where do i start um it's uh yeah it's like night and day it's um you know, I think, yeah, I think like the, the, the first part is like to begin with the communication because that's, um, I think that's the bread and butter of, of any relationship. And I think that was also what was missing back then. Like yeah, whenever she had any issues, she couldn't, she couldn't really talk to me about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but that's there now. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really amazing how, you know, um, we can we can talk about anything and and issues are not like like problems anymore because you can just talk about it mm-hmm. yeah and like what's the energy like between you two now um yeah what's the energy like if you could describe that i know it's vague <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's fun it's like uh inclusive it's like sharing so it's yeah it's it's very different to to what it was before um and uh yeah uh yeah if that's how i would yeah yeah like you said to me um how the relationship is like now is like better than how it was like in the peak of the first stint of the relationship the first three years right yeah like to you when you were in the dips of your relationship and you, when you were kind of like foreseeing what it should be, what was that for you? Like, what was, what's your, what was your uh, ideal relationship dream at that point in time? 
when I was in the dips, like uh, yeah, when you were in like the toughest moments, when you when when you bas- she basically said, "I want to break." Yeah, um, what was I thinking back then? I don't know. I don't think I even had an imagination of what it would be like. I just wanted <laughs> to to like kind of go sort of back to where I was before um and uh so i couldn't even imagine um first of all finding this program and also um because like that was just not even even in my reality of of uh of working on all these different things you know it's funny um you say that because like we we give a lot of the example of like the like have i given you the example of the uh, 2022 runner and the 1930s runner before so uh, yeah. you know how runners now, right? In 2022, they can run the 100 meter dash under 10 seconds, basically all the time. Even high school runners, amateur runners can do this. It's an expectation, yeah. right? But if you fast, if you backtrack to 1930s, it was impossible for people to run the 100 meter dash under 10 seconds, like humanly impossible. Now, physically, we didn't really change. We're just kind of the same height still. Anatomic, anatomically, we're still the same. But imagine like if you had a time machine and you were 2022 runner and you transfer yourself back to 1930s, people would think you're fucking crazy, right? If you say, <laughs> I can, you can run under, under 10 seconds, you will get laughed out of the room. But I think that's a problem of like glass ceiling, right? Mm. Um, when you, before you joined the program, you had this glass ceiling of what you thought a relationship should be, could be. And I think what you're saying here is that I blew past that. I help you blow past that and go like, okay, this is what it should be. And this is how yeah. you get there and show you the path as well. Um, but I think, I, which brings me to my first point, which is, I think you said in the beginning that you had two hesitations for joining the program. Number one, you thought it wasn't going to work for you because you were doing long distance. Mm. Number two, you didn't think it was going to work for you as well because she was extremely checked out. Like she was done. Yeah. Like she, she was, she made up her mind that she was done. Yeah. Um, Cause like a lot of people, I think feel those things. So I guess, tell me that, first of all, tell me that thinking in the beginning um, when you were first like looking at my YouTube videos and, and, and so on. And I did say, in a lot of my YouTube videos, no situation is unique, no situation is dire. N- it, it, nothing is different. Like we can help everything, right? Yeah. What was your thought process? Why didn't you believe me at that point in time? Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, uh, yeah, that, I think that was my hesitation. And uh, I hadn't checked out too many of your videos before, um, you know, uh, before the breakup. Uh, so, so right when the breakup happened, that's when I started to Google and, you know, go crazy on YouTube, um, uh, to, yeah, <laughs> uh, just see what was out there. Um, but yeah, that was just like, sort of this, like, um, mentality that I had, like, oh, this, my situation is unique, uh, and it's ne- never going to work because, you know, I can't even see her, um, you know because, uh, you know, we're in different cities. So how am I even going to do all these steps, you know, yada, yada. Um, but it's, you know, you go through the course and it's pretty much exactly the same, um, as many other people in the program and many other people in the program have the exact same situation as well. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So like what changed this for you though? So you went from thinking your situation was a bit unique and then was it when you joined the program and you saw all these other people kind of going through the similar situations, having this, basically, no matter what your situation is, you have the same remedies, you, you, you have the same diagnosis, the same remedies, no matter what, uh, and they were getting success. Was that what changed your mind or did it happen beforehand, after? Like, what was the progression of learning, of realizations that make you go, oh, mine is not that unique? Yeah, I think it was that just like getting into the program and then just seeing like all these members like having success and and also like uh, like and also like seeing other people's uh, like uh, situations that was even 
sounded worse than me to, <laughs> to be fair uh and you know that kind of just made it click like okay you know i see this guy over here he has like like even a like in my mind even worse situation you know <laughs> <laughs> so like if you know if if these guys can do it then you know then it must be uh something to it to yeah. this process yeah um i always tell people to when because i get some emails sometimes from people saying like well will this work if insert whatever situation they they are facing here yeah yeah and the question i bring back to them is okay do you know how many people we enroll per year let me tell you, 1,500. Do you know of those 1,500, how many of those people wait until things are very dire before seeking this program? Just like you, all of them, right? <laughs> and do you know how many of those people get results? Like you said, pretty much if you do the work, you'll get there. Yeah. So how absurd is it for someone to say, my situation is the most unique? the most different, the most dire, like statistically speaking, right? If you're saying you're one out of right now, 3000, mm. do you think you're that special? <laughs> like seriously, yeah. right? It's a bit <laughs> absurd to think that like statistically speaking, even. Um, yeah. So the other thing also is, I think when you first joined the program, you mentioned, and I could be wrong here. There was a period of time when you weren't, 100% sold, surrendered to that, right? You were still kind of trying to do it your own way a little bit. And then you had to kind of go back and redo certain parts. Was that true? Did that happen to you? Um, I think I think it might have happened a little bit in the beginning because uh, because I also had like a little sense of urgency as well because... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had uh, we had this break, and uh, we already had this pre-planned um, uh, like time together, like uh, after I, this. I, I remember was, that. Okay. Yeah, which was pretty much just like one week after it happened, uh, or no, I think like ten days or something. Mm. And so, so I was really like rushing through the program to <laughs> in order to just, even though uh, you know, I think Jason was on the call a call with me. Um, um, and uh, he was like, I was telling him, you know, about the situation and, and he was like, whatever you do, don't rush through, you know, the first stages. And that just he, went straight out of my, <laughs> out of my, over my head. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there was, there was like yeah, this period of where I, I like kind of rushed through the beginning and then I had to sort of play catch up after that because yeah, I think like rushing through the program is is never a good idea. <laughs> but it's funny it wasn't because it wasn't just J Jason who said it. So Jason Newman, a lot of you watching this video may know that name because he's kind of like my gatekeeper for the program. Yeah, um, yeah. He sorts through all the applications, but it wasn't just Jason who told you that. It was me and yes. many other members constantly for weeks or months. But all that stuff went over your head, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's an interesting thing because uh, recently I've been talking to my team more about um, enrolling less people who think their situation is special or unique somehow. So, you know, when you were applying, I think if you were to apply today, I don't think you would have gone in <laughs> like yeah. right away. Yeah. Right. And the reason why is we realize that people who think their situation is unique is impossible to coach because mm. Here I was in the program telling you, your situation is not unique. It's not as urgent as you think. Just do this and you'll be fine. And I told you this many times, but you skipped it. Yeah. Right? It went over your heads because in your mind, you think, no, 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 no. Other people can take it slow. Other people can do this. This will work for other people. But it was not yeah. going to work for me because mine is different somehow. Right? So that feeling is very insidious. It's very strong. And we realize that as a coach, we can't really coach people away from that. You just have to learn it yourself kind of thing. And often the way people learn it is by making their own mistakes and realizing, oh, shoot, okay, let me just listen to something. Yeah. Um, and I think there are two questions that I want people to ask themselves if they think the situation is unique, right? Number one is going by this quote from 
you cannot solve your problems using the same thinking you used to create it in the first place. Mm. So when you think your situation is unique, is different, are you using the same thinking that got you to the problem in the first place? The same glass ceiling, for example, the same expectations, the same processes, the same principles. 100%, the answer is always yes. Because now, like, if I were to ask you, if you could look back in time, Frederick, and tell your January 2022 self, dude, chill the fuck out. Listen yeah. to Jeff. It sounds obvious now, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, yeah, it's, it's like something, yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's just like so different mindsets now compared to like back then. Like the, back then it's like you're in panic mode <laughs> and you're just like, <laughs> I need to do something quick and whatever. But then once you get started with it, you realize that you have so much more time and your partner is, is always watching as well. And so it's like, yeah. 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 You so that's the first thing I want people to ask is like, what thinking are you using? And be honest with yourself, right? Mm. Because if you had our thinking, if you had my thinking, your thinking now, we look at newbies now in the program and, and they're like the same, they're like frantic. Yeah. And we kind of like chuckle at that. It's like, ah, fucking noobs, right? Yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll learn, they'll get it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But the second question that you need to ask yourself, um, is like, 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 like the second question you need to ask if you think your situation is unique here is really, man, I, I, I'm losing my train of thinking here. One sec. I might, I might cut this part, but whoo, what was yeah. I going to say? Shit. Um, oh, it's the analogy of the failing performer, right? So imagine mm. you are a failing performer. So let's say you're a basketball player or dancer, right? You've been failing your whole life. You're obviously failing in your relationship here as a performer. Mm. And you're in the middle of a game. Your instincts tell you to do one thing. In this case, your instincts tell you to rush, to skip some, some certain things, to think your situation is special, to ignore certain things. But your coach is telling you the exact opposite. In the middle of a game here. Mm. Who do you follow? The question is obvious. Uh, the answer is obvious. Yeah. You follow the coach. Yeah. But if I were to ask you back then, I think if you were honest, you would say, I was following me. I was following what I want to do, what I thought was right, which again was guided mm. by the old thinking. So if you ask yourself those two questions, you can really open up your mind to really polarize it, really be honest with yourself and go, am I BSing myself right now? when I think my situation is a bit unique, right? Um, yeah. But I want to move on to the second point here, which is, again, it doesn't take two to tangle. Um, I guess, tell me more about how you fell into that in the beginning and why you thought that it took two to tangle. Like, what was, how did it come up in your mind? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it takes two to tangle. Like, first of all, just, always heard that and i think that's sort of something that's um kind of i thought uh from everyone around me telling me that you know it should be you know this you know first of all it, like relationships shouldn't take any effort you know i've i've kind of been told that and uh and you know because love should feel you know effortless or kind of like you know this sort of thing. Uh, and I think that kind of like also made me think that as well, but that's, that's such a hopeless, uh, you know, mindset to have as well. Um, because you can't, there's nothing you can do then, you know, there's mm -hmm. like, if, if, if it takes two to tango, like then, then you're screwed. Then like the situation is just going to go downhill from there. Yeah, it's interesting. So I think when I look back into my own journey and I thought about why I fell for the takes to the tango, um, like you said, one was influence from media, friends and everything like that. Now, yeah. when, you, uh, when, when she wanted space and you guys were kind of like broken up there, um, 
what did your friends and family tell you? Oh yeah, that's also a good one. I mean, yeah, they told me like, you know, there's plenty of fish in the sea, you know, all this kind of stuff, like, uh, you know, think about, you know, you can do better or whatever, like all these kind of things um, that would, you know, get thrown at you as well. Like, you know, there's something wrong with her, you know, and, you know, you should just, you know, drop this, you know. (laughs) (laughs) And you said it was... Like to the tango, right? Should be a very encouraging principle for a lot of people because, like, mm-hmm. it makes it easier. But, but for you said something interesting, which is it actually depressing for you. Why do you say it's depressing that principle of takes to the tango? Yeah, because uh, you know, if if then then it just takes one person to be like you know, I'm upset right now. And then, you know, then it's like this negative cycle. Like you can't do it. If, if one person is, is, you know, feeling a certain way, then, you know, the whole relationship would crash, you know? Yeah. So I kind of feel that too. Like I look back at like how my relationship kind of degraded. So let's say this is uh, my partner. This is me. It's almost like we talk about this with the tetheredness, right? If a partner were to fall or sink, I look at her sinking and I go, well, I can't, I can't keep this boat alive yeah. by myself. So yeah. screw her then. So I sink too. Yeah. Right. Is that mentality of like, so I would say this take to, it takes to the tango. It's like the cruelest lie in relationships because it creates this, you, it puts you in this mind space where you play victim a lot. You now become mm-hmm. tethered. And once you become tethered and you play victim, you can no longer become a leader. And when life gives your relationship challenges, one, it, it just takes one of you to sink and the, all the ships sink. Because it's almost like, you know, if you have a crew of, in, in the ship, right? If one person in that crew were to go like, oh, I'm tired today. Everyone is like, oh, fine, I'm tired too. Who cares? I can't do this myself, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just such a bad cycle. And I can't believe that that's what people believe, you know? Like they cannot see how toxic that is. Um, Yeah. So how do you see things now? So obviously you went through the journey of pretty much saving the relationship by yourself, especially in the beginning parts of it. Yeah. So how do you, if you were standing in front of someone who was convinced that they, it takes you to tango, how would you use your life story and your, what you know now to kind of explain to them why it's not, true (laughs) yeah that's good good one i think i think like uh, it's like uh, it's when you think it takes two to thank tango it's like um you you've already lost before you began because you can't really do anything so i mean the the very least you can do is you know to take charge yourself and and then really you know that's the only way you can find out anyway if if it's uh, that's a good philosophical things, question yeah yeah if things can work you know and so so that's like all about i think like taking responsibility and and uh you know for for your own self first uh and then you'll see yeah it's a very good <laughs> philosophical question of like uh, that's like uh, metaphysics, right? Because I always get the question too. Well, Jeff, if I do this program, how do I know if I will get my wife back? It's like, yeah. Well, you don't. Yeah. But what I can tell you is that if you keep your current mindset, if you still believe it takes two to tango, then you will never find out. Yeah, exactly. But the only way you can find out is if it's this. Now, in my head, in the back of my head, I'm thinking. It's, if you do the work, it's guaranteed. You won't get her back. It's impossible to find someone yeah. that can even play close to your level for her, right? Yeah. So it's guaranteed for me. But I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to go like, well, it's up to you. Do you want to find out what the probability is or not? Do you want to see it for yourself? See it to believe it kind of thing. Because again, yeah. it's almost like if the 2022 coach goes back to 1930s and he says like, oh, you can run, run under 10 seconds. No one, no, no, like no one will believe him. Does the coach go, 
well, let me tell you all the reasons why it's true. Or does he just go like, look, you want to come on board? Just trust me for a bit and you'll believe it. That's the better way, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And the way I think about it too, about uh, why it doesn't take two to tango is, you know, if you look back in your relationship back then, what you did as a person was already affecting your partner, right? Mm. So if you were to, like, for example, like pretend like you're, you're perfect, you, you cause fights, you cause ultimatums, that actually influences what your partner does. Like you, we cannot deny that. So we know even today, what you do, what we do already affects our partner. And not only does it affect our partner, it affects the environment of the relationship, which further affects our partner, right? So what we do affects our partner directly, but also indirectly via the environment. So if you were already affecting your partner and the relationship in a negative way, what makes you think you cannot affect it in a positive way? So people always say like, Mm. oh, you can't change someone. That's not true because you already are doing that. You are changing someone already. Every single day, every single thing you do, every single decision you make, you're changing the other person. So how can you say you can't change someone, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, So philosophically speaking, it's it's, it's sounds simple when you put it like that. And the other thing too is like, I get the the question of, uh, well, what if my partner is just messed up? (laughs) What if I'm doing everything I can to change the environment, to do well, but she's not looking at it properly or she's not recognizing it? Well, I told those people like, well, let's take a look at what you're saying there, right? You're saying that what you're doing is so perfect. Mm -hmm. And if your partner's not coming back to you, it's because she's so fucked up in the head. She cannot see the value of you even when the value is, you think, staring her right in the face. You think she's so messed up. She can't make proper decisions like that. If that's what you think, do you understand why she's not coming back to you? Look at the irony of that statement, right? The, the, the circular nature of that argument of like, oh, what, what if she doesn't want to be with me? Um, so think about those things, guys, when you're thinking about like, whether it takes two to tango or not. Mm. Um, the other thing that's interesting for me also is uh, you said emotional safety is really the key to removing that catch-22. Uh, and yeah. that's something that we've been trying to teach people for quite a while, right? Which is that if you fix emotional safety, you really fix everything because you, you are like opening the floodgates of everything. Now, when you were in the beginning, like before you joined the program, right? What did you think the problem was? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <That's a hard laughs> yeah. I, th- well, I, I actually had no idea. Like I, I was telling uh, my girlfriend as well, like, you know, I was, you know, I was like a blind, uh, you know, person just trying everything because I had no clue because we had, <laughs> didn't have, <laughs> we didn't have this emotional safety and, and uh, to talk about these things. And, and that's why I also like uh, back in December when when um, uh, and she told me this later that, you know, she was in her head, she was completely done, like she was completely checked out, but she couldn't even tell me that like while we were there because, you know, there was no way for her to to do it because over time, like that communication had been, just been breaking down Um and in, in subtle ways, but also like uh, overt ways as well, where, you know, uh, she tried to bring up something in the past and, and, you know, I would just, you know, ignore it or kind of like push it off to the side uh, and, mm-hmm. and sort of, uh, you know, like uh, think that these things that she was bringing up was like kind of like bringing di- down the vibe or something, whereas mm-hmm. she was actually just trying to communicate yeah why so like let's let's break this up into multiple subcategories of conversations or because like the first ca- uh, category of conversations we can have is around because i think even though we don't know the term emotional safety you didn't know the term emotional safety until you saw me 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think in the back of our heads, we all know it's important, right? Like mm-hmm. we don't know what it is. We don't know. We don't know how to label it, but we know like uh, that thing. Yeah. I need to create that thing. That's important. Mm-hmm. That thing. But if you look back and your relationship, just three years, right? How how did you break that emotional safety? Because you didn't want to break it. Like like of mm-hmm. course you wanted your partner to like talk to you to express things to you. But how yeah. did you? destroy it in the first place you think yeah i think uh yeah kind of like i mentioned before like uh it's kind of like every time she brought up something like uh if she was pissed or she had like an emotion as well like uh then i sort of got pissed at her or sort of like you know i i sort of it riled me up because i had no idea uh how to deal with it actually like both internally, but also like how to to communicate and and talk talk about it, because uh, I was a very like solutions sort of person, and and um, I would Real always <laughs> just, yeah exactly just like you know wh- wh- what are you talking about you you're upset at this thing like let's just fix it you know like what is <laughs> you know that was my mindset and you know and and I didn't want to like stay with the emotions and 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 sort of explore explore that with her um so so in that way i actually got angry as well and and you know that's like sort of like the cycle that just you know uh yeah i think a lot of people can relate to that and i think we made a video about this like recently uh where we called it like the allergy to resistance right where yeah so there's a couple of things that goes on i think in people's heads I think it went on in my head back then, which is like, if your partner, if you're in a relationship and your partner brings up to you a problem, something she's unhappy about, maybe it's you, mm. maybe it's the relationship, yeah. maybe it's something to not even to do with the relationship, right? But she's not yeah. happy. First, we fall into this thinking of being the perfect male. So we yeah. believe this uh, notion of if we're this super high value guy, mm. women will swoon, all over us women will like jump over fences yeah. they'll make it easy for us to always be like jolly and seductive and feminine whatever it is like we hear that right the more yeah. masculine you are the more, more feminine she gets so if she's not feminine if she's not happy what is that telling us that tells us that we're not masculine we're not high value when something is wrong with us etc right mm. and we get insecure so yeah your partner tells you something she's unhappy about and then you go, oh, I feel insecure, right? The second thing also is, you, you mentioned this yourself, which is you have this idea that a relationship is effortless. If it's meant to be, it's going to be effortless. If it's not mm-hmm. meant to be, then it's going to be hard. So if it's hard, if she's telling me all these things she's unhappy about, if it's hard, then maybe, maybe it's not meant to be. So then you get yeah. insecure about like losing the relationship. It's like, oh, right? And so all these very subconscious paradigms that we hold in our head about what a relationship is supposed to be, it affects how we interpret situations. It affects how we feel. And this happens very reflexively. Like if you were transport yourself back then, with knowing what you know back then, with the way how, how you thought back then, nothing would have changed. Like you would still have done the same thing and thought the same thing and felt the same thing, you know? That's yeah. the unfortunate part. Yeah. Um, and so then like when your partner starts to express her gripes all this insecurity you have you cannot help but feel like you lost your bulletproof vest you lost your emotions you you and you will do all the wrong things because the second point too which is like um being bulletproof right because a lot of people say frederick like it's really funny a lot of people say well jeff um I was bu- bu- I'm bulletproof. I can control my emotions. <laughs> but yeah. When my partner does says this or says that, it's just too much for me. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to that person now? Like knowing what you know now about like the bulletproof vest, like dude, what would you say? That's not even a vest. That's like uh, you know, that's <laughs> then I mean because that's that's what being bulletproof means it's like it's not what you do when things are easy it's what what you do when things are hard and you know that's the real test of 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 uh of uh how you can handle handle that 
um, and that's sort of something you have to work on on yourself and and uh, yeah yeah exactly it's like changing that the, all those like very um, reflexive interpretations in your head which causes the reflexive emotions so when you get resistance now, I think you said this yourself, like you don't even feel bad anymore. You actually feel no. like, yes, I love it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I'll give a, one example of this and I want you to give yours later on too. You know, I was uh, driving with my partner, uh, Samantha, and I made a joke to her. Uh, it was a bit of an insensitive joke. I got, I got to admit, but I yeah. thought it was funny, um, but she took it the wrong way. So she got like pissed in the car. Right. And for a lot of people, I think in that moment, they would see her getting pissed and they would kind of blame her for it. She would go like, oh, come on, take a joke. Like, relax. Why, why do you want yeah, to ruin yeah. our night? It's just a simple mm-hmm. joke. Like, don't make it a big deal. Don't be a drama queen, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, the way I interpreted it was, okay, there is something that she's been holding in herself. There's something she's unhappy about with me. Something, she, some baggage she's holding here. That, that joke was triggered all those interpretations, the wrong ones, and caused it to mis- uh-huh. misinterpret me, right? So I was like, okay, perfect. So this is the time that I need to identify what that is and turn it from negative to positive. So the next thing yeah. I asked her was, oh, um, seems like what I said that kind of made you mad. Uh, I guess I could see it how it can be taken in a wrong way and this way and this way and this way. I guess tell me more about what you're thinking here. And so she starts to tell me about all these ways that she's been, yeah, like you always say this about me. I always feel this in the relationship. And it ended up being a great conversation about her telling me the problems and me knowing about it and me like yeah. listening, her feeling understood and it became like this amazing bonding moment. Yeah. Right. Not only did it strengthen the relationship, it also created more safety, but it all started with the different way of thinking about that resistance. And it's a reflexive thing, right? Yeah. So I'm sure during your vacations, you kind of feel, you know, vacationing sounds fun, but there's a lot of logistics. There's a lot of, you know, crap that happens during a vacation. Yeah, yeah. a lot. Yeah. I mean, was there like a story like that where you saw the resistance, you saw it as a positive now, you turn it from negative to positive and it all began because like you saw it differently, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think we were at, at, there was one point we were in France. Um, I think it was Paris or something. And, uh, you know, um, and, uh, I think we were taking a picture or something like that. And, uh, <laughs> and she got really upset, uh, because, um, you know, there was something about me taking her like uh, taking the photo and, and she didn't really, you know, uh, you know, she didn't really like the photos afterwards, you know, and she got really upset um, <laughs> in this way. But instead, instead of like me being like, okay, why is she acting like this and everything? Like I was actually just genuinely curious and, and uh, my mindset was like, you know, okay, let's go. Like, this is, this is like, uh, you know, like a moment here that we can, you know, connect and, and sort of figure out like, what is it here? And, um, you know, and after that, it just, uh, you know, turned into like the best day ever. So (laughs) yeah. (laughs) I mean, I think the the thing that's in people's minds, I can, I can, if I can read people's minds, right. the, The one question they're asking is, okay, how do you go? in the beginning part. So I get how you can create safety and your head, you can turn from negative to positive. If you're having contact, if you're vacationing together, I get it. Mm. But in the beginning moments, when you, when she was like done and she told you herself, she was done. How did you create safety then? Yeah, that was, yeah, exactly. That was, um, you know, That was not, uh, um, that was f- for going through the program. Um, you kind of get into, uh, after a while, uh, you get into um, this part where you need to start your campaigns, right? So, yeah, um, we had, uh, you know, a couple of talks 
like over the phone, like l- really long talks, like for hours and hours. Um, you Who know, initiated this? Go. Was that something you initiated? Something she initiated? Yeah, exactly. Something um, you initiated? Yeah, something I initiated, yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was, if I would look back onto it, it was, yeah, it was me that initiated it. Yeah. Um, Because, like, when you first joined, I think, I think the reason why it's, you're struggling to answer this too, right? It's because I think there's a lot of preconceived notions about what the reconciliation process looks like. You know, sometimes when, when we hear these uh, success stories like this one, we tend to see like, oh, you did, the, you did the program. And then once you did the program, uh, everything was effortless. Like, like I made my changes and suddenly in some, magical, in some magical way, your partner suddenly sees your changes. Suddenly everything is fine. And she's talking to mm-hmm. you now. But the truth is not, it's very far from that. The truth is like yeah. in the first part of everyone's journey and your journey too, we told you become a performer first, right? Because mm-hmm. in the beginning, we, before you joined the program and your partner wasn't talking to you, the thinking in your head was, how the hell do I get in? How the hell do I get in? When do I get my shot here to say my piece, yeah. to like show her my changes? If she's not even looking at me, she's not even thinking about me. She's not even talking to me. How the fuck do I show? Right? Yeah. But the reason why you cannot create those opportunities is because you suck at the frameworks. It's because you suck at your internal shifts. You're thinking about things the wrong way, right? So it's almost like that chicken or the egg thing. If, if I see someone asking the question, how do I make, create contact? It tells me that the last thing they need to focus on is to create contact. Because if they ask, are asking, if they still don't know how to create contact, then they're basically saying, I suck at the framework so bad. I don't know how to create opportunities when none exist. I don't know how to take advantage of the opportunities that are right in front of me. You're not skilled enough. But yeah. as you start to grow your skills in the frameworks, you start to have a lot of ideas to go like, oh, I know the frameworks. I know how to improvise. And I can find all these ins, all these like angles that I can get in and start a conversation. And I think that was what happens to you, right? Where you, the creatively, you just get to go. So a great analogy of this is almost like um, if you were a great dancer, for example, only mm. great dancers can freestyle. But if I ask a non-dancer, like if you ask me right now, freestyle dance, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I fucking can't. Like, there's all these opportunities for me to move in all these ways, but I can't spot it because I suck so bad. Right? Same thing. If you suck so bad at the frameworks, you're drowning in opportunities, but you don't see it. Yeah. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, I think like there was like this in the beginning, like you wouldn't, you didn't even know where to to begin, you know, uh, and and then as you go along and then you start practicing, you start seeing everything, uh, you know, that you can pick up and and okay, wow, there's actually a, uh, you know, a thing behind the thing here, like I can I can dive into this and like okay, and then you start to see like you know all the ways that you kind of. Uh, fucked up in the past as well (laughs) Uh, (laughs) so so you know that's yeah the there's there's so many opportunities so yeah it's uh yeah yeah but it can be hard in the beginning to see it yeah to see it so i think the takeaway from this is if you're watching this and you're asking to yourself like well my partner's not even we're doing long distance my partner's not even in the same house we're not even talking she blocked me all these things and you're thinking to yourself, how do I even show my changes? If you're asking mm. that, that's a telltale sign that you haven't changed. Because yeah. it means that you suck so bad, you don't know how to create opportunities. And trust me, right? Trust me when I say that's true. Um, yeah. Now, so like, let's kind of wrap this up on the, the emotional safety side. Um, actually, let's call it a day on the emotional safety side, right? Because like what, what I want to wrap this up with is basically saying once you created that emotional safety, once you know the in and you can start to have the conversations, really the process of creating emotional safety is very simple, 
right? Mm -hmm. I want you to imagine like a farm. Underneath the farm right now, there's all these like parasites in there. Yeah. Basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to reach into the farm, right? Or like maybe hit, hit the ground mm -hmm. so the parasites pop up. Once they pop up, you grab it and you fling it away. Yeah. So campaigns are the same thing, right? Campaigns, what you want to do is you want to start a campaign, often the challenging ones, that often makes you want to resist. But that mm. resistance is a mole or some parasite popping up. Once that pops up, you take it, you paraphrase it, you turn it from negative to positive, and you keep doing this. <laughs> yeah. And over time, you'll create safety. Now, in the beginning, you're going to be the one kind of instigating things. But after a while, your partner will start to raise a lot of things by herself. Hmm. Uh, nonetheless, once you understand the problem, once you get the resistance, the process stays the same, right? It doesn't change. So the, the thing about this too is that I can ask my partner all day long, for example, um, hey, tell me what's not making you feel safe. She can't tell me, right? Because like, it's yeah. not in her mind. Like You can't just go to your partner and go, like, tell me what's, what's, how you're feeling unsafe. But it's those moments, again, the unexpected moments when you make a joke, she takes it the wrong way. Hmm. Those are the moments that will reveal a lot of those moles, right? But if you're not having the right internal shifts, the right mindset, the right paradigms, the right skills to be able to, to spot that and to turn it from negative to positive, then you're screwed there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's wrap that one up because I want to talk about this. Uh, two other things. One is the antithetic mindset. Um, that was the first one you put on, like when I gave you the write-up to go like, hey, t t uh, give me some ideas what, what to talk about. Yeah. That was the first one you put. Why was that the first one? And, and why was that like your priority? The biggest thing for you? Yeah, that's, uh, I think that was pretty much one of, yeah, my biggest takeaways from, from the program as well. It's like, uh, you know, because um, like, I think I like, back then and uh, all throughout my life I've also I've been this very uh, you know hypothetic person like very uh, stubborn uh, person and uh, I think that kind of also like led to a lot of um, you know um, negative spirals in the relationship where you know I was I was too stuck up on 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 one thing and you know I I didn't like this I didn't didn't want to do this and you know, it, it was kind of like, it kind of limited me and, and us in many ways. Mm. Um, and so uh, this idea of the, uh, the, uh, the antithetic uh, mindset is that, you know, uh, you know, there's this, you might be wrong, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's discovering what you don't know, essentially. And, and, trying to um to see the other side uh completely yeah um, you know this is so many yeah. implications and i think you know it's funny whenever i, I do these interviews right because like with these interviews i'm asking you to summarize hundreds of hours of content into like an hour it's hard yeah, yeah. it's overwhelming yeah, it's yeah. like okay how do i explain this anesthetic mind <laughs> yeah. let's just like pick two two things i've been thinking a lot about right one is around why are so many people getting blindsided by their partner wanting a divorce, separation, et cetera? That's a key question. Why are so many people getting blindsided? Well, let's look at emotional safety again, right? Emotional safety mm -hmm. lives in a blind spot. So yeah. if you're lacking emotional safety in a relationship, you can never find out because your partner can never feel safe enough to tell you that she doesn't feel safe enough. It's, it's, it's ironic like that. Yeah, yeah. Right? So for your case, like, emotional safety has been destroying for a long time, and then she's finally drops the bomb and go like, I don't want this anymore. Right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of you listening to this may be feeling the same too. Well, the reason why you can never find if emotional safety is broken or not, though, is because of the way you question it. So if you question it in a hypothetic way, hypothetic meaning like hypothesis, right? That word. You will ask a question, what am I doing right? How am I creating safety? What is she expressing? And if you ask those questions, you will find many reasons why you have safety. You will find many reasons that she's, many instances of her sharing. Yeah. Right? 
But it, but if you ask the questions that way, it will keep you in this ignorance is bliss state, right? But if you went antithetic and you ask yourself, how am I not creating safety? How am I destroying safety? How am I missing opportunities to create safety? What is she not sharing instead of what is she sharing, mm. right? What is wrong with this relationship? Not what is right with the relationship. Yeah. If you ask those questions, you would have found the problems much sooner. Right? Yeah. yeah. And here's the tricky part is like, when you talk about your subconscious, your, you know, what we're teaching here in this course, it's not, it's not like a mathematical course. It's not like I can point out to you the problem. Here's the problem. And have you fix it? We're dealing with blind spots. We're dealing with deep programming. So we're dealing with subconscious thoughts and processes. And in order for you to find the subconscious thoughts, you got to learn how to be antithetic. Yeah. And you got to learn. That's why if you look at great problem solvers, great business leaders, great therapists even, note their questions. Their questions are always antithetic, never hypothetic. And you got to do the same. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's really beautiful. Like when, when you learn this and, and uh, you know, uh, it's because otherwise you, you're not really going to learn anything new. You're just going to stay in your, your uh, hypothetic mindset and, and, you know, okay, <laughs> what are you going to learn from that? You know? And, yeah. uh, and yeah. also like, uh, I think, uh, you know, when, when all this began, like, um, there were so many thoughts that I had in my own head as well, that was, you know, based off of, you know, just my mind running crazy on things. Um, and I think also for just, you know, for my own, um, mental clarity, it was like so crucial to, to, to have this mindset as well, because I could suddenly, I could, could be like, okay, I'm thinking this way right now, like what could be like the anti to this or what could be wrong about this, you know? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, you know, I was kind of balancing the scales there. And, um, and, uh, and, and at that time, like suddenly I didn't feel as bad, you know, for example, about this one thought that I had, for example, and, you know, that's, that's how you can, you know, explore it. Yeah. And I think the, the thing you're alluding to with the antithetic mind is that it's, it's the key to really feeling, being truly open-minded, right? Yeah. And if you guys are interested in, uh, in watching a video about what being truly open-minded means, I have a video about that. So just Google my name, antithesis or antithetic mind, whatever it is, you'll find it. But it's a very difficult one to articulate. And I gave you the example of the game, the, the numbers game, right? How people like, they think they're open-minded, but really they're still open-minded in a close-minded way. Right? Yeah. They're still thinking within this box of what they think is possible. So even if they're asking questions, even if they're asking their partner to talk and explain their side, they can never really truly understand their side mm. because they're already like locked in their answer in a way. Right? So yeah. this has major implications on communication, on conflict resolution, major, major implications on that. I think the biggest implication on that, though, is just the richness of your life, too, right? Um, we talk about this quote of true freedom and power is not about um, doing what you like, being who you are, and avoiding what you don't like, and avoiding who you're not. It, true freedom and power is about becoming whoever you want to become, or you need to become, to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. And I think the, the best benefit of the antithetic mind is almost like you know you know that when you play an rpg game sometimes you have the skills wheel right where it's like oh charisma is like this and then you have your strength you have your agility you have your healing power i don't know what intelligence yeah so most people i think because they they kind of lock in their identity their bubble skill bubble is very small it may be high in one side but small on all other sides right and I think the classic example of this is how a lot of men, they can feel very comfortable at work because they can be very masculine at work. But when they go home, they need to be very feminine. They can't do that if they feel foreign. And so they bring this masculine nature to the feminine home and they struggle. But then when people complain, what do they say? 
they say, well, screw you for not accepting me as who I am. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But when you become antithetic, what happens is you're seeing the pros and cons of everything. You're not seeing a thing as it's good or bad anymore. It's almost like that wheel becomes bigger, right? On all sides. Mm. So now if you need to play a certain character at home, you can do it. If you need to play a certain character in work, you can do it. It's almost like you become water, almost like the best actor in the world where you can feel genuine, you can feel good at anywhere you go. I yeah. think that's crucial for you, especially when you were going on a vacations and you guys were talking yeah. about different interests, doing different things. That must have been very crucial, no? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just, yeah, different topics, different things. Like I generally like feel like I can, I can see the value in anything now and I can see... I can enjoy pretty much anything because, you know, <laughs> because of this mindset almost, it's like, you know, it's really uh, like, uh, it's really like a sense of freedom to, to be able to, to think this way because yeah, it's there, there's so many possibilities and you can do. Yeah. I know. Yeah, it's great because everything. like, yeah. um, and you can apply this. I recently made a video too about the five love languages. Right. And yeah. I say to people like, Basically, when people do the five love languages, they often do it in a standpoint of like, give me more of what I like, give me less of what I don't like, right? Yeah. But that's kind of a shame because, you know, your partner may not always give you the things you want. Sometimes she's showing love and the things that you don't appreciate. Like for me, for example, mm -hmm. I never really appreciated affirmation. Like words of affirmation and that means nothing to me, right? Mm. But that was her love language. And so naturally she's going to want to give me affirmation a lot. Yeah. So she feels like she was doing all this work to give me love, but it just flew over my head because I didn't appreciate it. I didn't yeah. learn to appreciate it, right? What yeah. if we can become the person who is comfortable giving all five and receiving all five? I mean, that changes the dynamic of the relationship completely. And you can mm. apply this to your preferences, your taste preferences, your preferences on movies, uh, activities, whatever it is. Like I used to be such a Debbie Downer, right? Whenever we hang out, whenever we have a date, we only do certain things because I was so locked in. I like this. I don't like this. Yeah, right. Yeah. And like our date became so boring. It became so stale because like we were doing the same things. Over and over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right? But now yeah. it's all kind of fun because like I learn to, to, to appreciate and see the value in all things. She wants to go to like um, Sephora, look at makeup. It's like, let's do it. Want to do your yeah. nails? Let's do it. And it inspires her to do the same too, you know, for my stuff. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, but I want to uh, end this by talking about, about the experience in the program a bit. Uh, so obviously before you joined the program, you were stalking me on YouTube for quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Was there a shock when you first joined the program and seeing the amount of content there? amount of people, the level people were playing at versus what you find on YouTube. Was there like a culture shock, I guess, in the beginning for you? Um, no, I think like I saw it, I joined the program, yeah, maybe like in the very beginning and then you you see all, you know, especially at the time where I was, you know, like in this very urgency mode, you know? um and then i was like oh how am i gonna complete all of this in like five <laughs> days you know <laughs> uh but then once you get through it it's uh, it's actually so amazing it's it's like um you know it's the course that i wanted to do like for a long time um you know i almost feel like you should have this in school in some ways because <laughs> They, I mean, you don't, you don't get taught this anywhere else. So, and I feel like it's so, so crucial to, to, to have. Um, and, um, but yeah, like, uh, it was a little bit of a, a shock as soon as I joined in, but I could also tell from the length of your videos as well, like that, uh, you know, there was going to be a lot of substance there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> was there a part yeah. of you that thought that was wondering, like, okay, the YouTube videos are pretty in-depth already. How much deeper can this get, really? Was there a part of you thinking that where, like, is this even worth it? Because, like, the YouTube videos are already pretty, pretty in-depth. <laughs> yeah, tell me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could kind of, uh, yeah, I see what you mean there. Like, I could, um, I could definitely think that 
yeah like there because there was so much value on the videos and themselves so like one part of me was also thinking like okay i could also almost just go off of YouTube this, you know and do it myself yeah. <laughs> yeah that was one thought i had as well and but uh but yeah so, it's just so much more in depth yeah so what would you say are the key differences because like obviously the program worked for you now, I don't know if the program would have worked for you if you didn't join the program or not, um, where you could just rely on YouTube. But like having seen both, what would you say are the key differences in allowing to get your results between the program and YouTube? Hmm. No, I, I don't know. I think like the program is such like a different animal. It's just like, uh, it's everything combined. It's, you know, all these different elements, you have the group, uh, you know, of, of that, that you get inspired by and, and you have for, for accountability and feedback and everything. Uh, so it's just, you know, if you just do it on the YouTube, you're, you're never going to get that far because, uh, you don't have all these animal elements and and the depth is really what's what makes it so special as well as um, like you can go so deep on on each topic and and uh, yeah so yeah but, yeah I think the challenge that I have is like because people compare my program to other programs in the space and so mm. a lot of people people have bought other programs and they're kind of disappointed by it they're like ah didn't really help me, didn't really go deep, didn't really tell me like anything mind-blowing. It just kind of told me what I already know, maybe like slightly better. It's more of an iteration than a revolution. It's not a revolution in their head, you know? Yeah. Um, but the thing is like, I always try to tell people like, no, this is a revolution. Like this will change the re rest of your life forever, forever. Yeah. And yeah. often in ways that you can't even imagine yet because your mind just can't grasp it. You have the ceiling, right? It's like the 1930s mm. people going like, oh, with the it's like th them looking at the way they're currently practicing and they're going like well even if i look at the current way we're practicing there's no way we can un run under 10 seconds it's like well no like we're not practicing the same way you are <laughs> like this is a revolution on that right? yeah um and it's so hard sometimes for people to like go over the hump of like just trusting us right um like there's this guy recently like literally we went on three calls with him I showed him the community and I showed him like, look, I'm not even like filtering this. I'm just showing you chronologically. Win, 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 win. Mm. How can you fake any of that? How can we fake a hundred, a thousand profiles? Yeah. Facebook, right? Yeah. And he still doesn't want to buy it. He still doesn't buy it. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. Something feels off. I'm like, look, man, I don't know what to tell you anymore. <laughs> like... If you could look back, were, were there doubts in your mind about like what this program can do? Or did you just go like, you know what, I'm just going to go all in. Like, what was your thought process? Yeah, man, I think, uh, I think I was just, I, I wanted to try something different. And I, I felt I've, I've tried a lot of different courses, uh, like uh, in my life as well. And I like even Tony Robbins and everything like that. Like, this is like, you know, a hundred times that, you know, <laughs> and that's like, <laughs> and that's pretty crazy, you know, cause that, that's like, uh, you know, but, but, uh, but, uh, I, I, I kind of just felt like, you know, I, I need to try something different, uh, at that point. And, and, you know, that's how, when I came across the videos and I was like, okay, this is going to be like spot on. So no matter what happens, let's just go. Pretty yeah. Much. Good. Good. Um, I mean, so what's next for you then? So you obviously complete, you've pretty much finished the program. Have you finished the program? Not yet, no. Wh which phase no. are you at? We have six phases. Which phase are you at? Yeah, so I'm I'm at uh, phase four, um, uh, module seven. So phase four, yeah, module seven. Have okay. A, oh my god, that go. that phase is like my favorite. Phase five is gonna be fucking amazing for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. I have five and six, but yeah. uh, phase four was when we talked about a lot of the dependency models and unconditional love illusions. We didn't get to talk about that today. But in uh -huh. the follow-up interview with your partner, I want to talk about that part because that's a fun one to talk about as a couple, I think. Yeah. Um, so coming up, guys, hopefully. But um, if you could 
So if you're standing in front of your old self right now, and your old self was someone who felt for the urgency illusion, thought he was unique, thought his situation was a bit hopeless, uh, thought like it takes two to tango, all these bad paradigms that you had, if you could give him one feedback, maybe something that we didn't talk about today yet. Like if you just think about this, you'll be okay. If you just do this, you'll be okay. What would that be? That's, wow. Yeah, that's hard. I would, oh. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I would say, wake up. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, I, I kind of, you know, it's kind of like you need to have this wake up call to just sort of get out of your, your habits and out of your, like there, there needs to take something in order to, I mean, at least for me, it took a lot because I had been doing like all these patterns, like for a long time and, you know, um, I probably would have kept doing the same if I didn't, you know, get this sort of yeah. uh, wake up call. Um, so I think like, yeah, <laughs> just, you know, uh, that's a yeah. great point. Right. So, cause like, obviously the one big benefit for what doing what I do is I get to see kind of a longitudinal study, uh, with people. Mm. So I work with people like for many years. So I get to see how they're like in the beginning and how I get to see how they're like at the end. In the beginning, people always feel, feel the same thing, which is that, um, you know, in the, in the beginning, it's like you, you get some slaps in the face where you, you have some troubles in a relationship, you have, feel some pain, whatever it is. But the slap wasn't hard enough to basically wake you up and go, oh shit, I need to do something differently. Right. So mm -hmm. we have some people are going to the program. They tell us with what their words to say, I want to do everything to save myself, to save the relationship. But then like you in the beginning, right. They didn't follow everything that we say. Yeah. This is trying to do it their way. Right. They're trying to escape the work. Maybe and they're yeah. trying to pretend like they don't need to work on themselves, but then life will always give, give you the same slaps in the face harder and harder each time until you learn from your mistakes. Right. So, they don't learn it the first time because they, they thought they were special, whatever it is. They make a second mistake, now even more painful, another slap in the face, but maybe they don't even wake up then. But they keep going through the same cycle until one slap goes, like make them fly off the room, right? That's when they wake yeah. up and they go, okay, I got to do this. And once they do it, like you, they get the results. And once they get the results, they realize something very interesting. They finally understand what I mean when I say you can never escape the work. Mm. Right? Because if you ever want a good relationship, if you ever want to be like completely fulfilled in your life, you do have to think and behave a certain way. You do have to live your life a certain way. Mm. And that's something you cannot skip, right? So you can skip it if you want but you won't get the outcome. The only way you want to get the outcome is that you don't escape that work, right? And the second thing they realize too is that it's better to realize this sooner than later. So the biggest shame is when I, I get like 60 or 70 year olds finally taking the program and they're going like, oh, but then for the 70 year olds, they only have like 20 years to live that to enjoy the benefits for you. How old are you now? 27, 27. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you realize this is 27, you have your whole life ahead of you. I mean, like yeah. you can utilize it for so long. So like, you know, people look back at them being stubborn the whole time, the decades of them being stubborn where people tell them like, you need to learn this. You need to learn this. I tell them you need to learn this, but they waste time. They go like, shit, I wish I didn't waste that time. Right. So yeah. I think that's why you would tell yourself, it's like, don't fucking waste time. Just jump yeah. into this. Yeah. Right? You have enough slaps in the face already. Because if you don't wake up now, you're going to 
get more slaps in the face later until you wake up anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so choose, choose your lane kind of like, yeah, choose your lane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Frederick, uh, what is it? Nine o'clock for you? Nine 30? Uh, 10, 10, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, 10 o'clock. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you on your way, but thank you so much for yeah. dedicating an hour plus of your time. Um, yeah, guys, thank if you. you want to explore the program that we talked about in this, um, interview, and understand the things that Frederick was talking about here a bit deeper. Uh, I have a masterclass that you can join. It's about an hour and a half. In that masterclass, I'll show you like the basic outline. It will never tell you everything, of course, because you know the, pro the program is like 100 plus hours, plus, plus. Um, but guys, I, I, I am serious when it says this will change your freaking life. It's a revolution. And I don't know how to tell you this without sounding sleazy or salesy or like overpromising, but... I don't overpromise here. I'm not overpromising here. This is legit. Um, yeah. So guys, if you want to uh, apply for the program, if you want to learn more about it, uh, I'm going to include the link down below this video with the masterclass. But again, Frederick, thanks so much. Um, yeah, man. <laughs>